as some of your uh, listeners may be aware of memory reconsolidation, you'll recognize that the two necessary components for memory reconsolidation to be launched have been activated. We've activated the the distress neural pathways through the initial setup of the session, getting them to reveal to me the worst part of the memory, the visual aspect that goes with that, the negative thoughts and beliefs about themselves, the emotion that goes with that, and the physiological state that goes with that distress pathway that's been fully reactivated. We've spent quite a bit of time um, revealing that, so the bilateral simulation tends to bring all that up with more intensity. That's been really quite well reactivated. And then at some point, either they spontaneously, um, what comes up for them when we're doing the bilateral stimulation is some kind of experience which stands in sharp contradiction to the what's been reactivated in the distress neural pathways, or I will engineer that through doing the inner child resourcing. And the person is able to then experience a very different kind of emotional state. So hello and welcome. My name is Vincent Ryan and I'm a psychotherapist based in Ireland. And I'm here today with Dr. James Alexander. James is a psychologist based in Lismore in New South Wales in Australia. Uh, today's interview is a part of a, of a series of interviews that we're doing around therapists who use experiential frames and techniques in their work with clients. So just a little bit of bio and background about James. So James, as I said, is a psychologist working with individuals and couples and so forth um, in, his, in his practice. Um, he has a particular interest in trauma and chronic pain. Uh, James also um, has a very quite a, quite a long history of working as a psychologist, 30 years, I believe, and began out uh, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, then um, retrained or added to that further training to that in brief solutions focused therapy um, in more recent times James has uh, trained in EMDR and I believe that's a big part of his work now and hopefully we'll get into that in a little while and he also has quite interest in the work of Bruce Ecker and coherence therapy which is something hopefully we might be able to touch on and um, so James you're very welcome thanks for having for 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 us for Thanks for coming today, I should say. Thank you, Vincent. It's great to be here talking with you. Great, so let's get into it. So um, first of all, maybe if I could ask you about, you know, experiential uh, therapy, like do you uh, find yourself using experiential frameworks and techniques in your work with clients? Well, look, as you said in, my, in your introduction, probably for about the last 15 years or so, I've been working primarily with EMDR. And uh, I view that as being inherently experiential in that when we're conducting an EMDR session, we're dealing with the, the lived experience that a person has in that moment, primarily in relation to memories. But the memories are something which is reactivated in the present moment during the therapy session. So in EMDR, we're working with the person's, like I said, memories, which is really just a symbolic representation of the experiences that, that they had in the past. And we very deliberately reactivate the neural pathways relating to those memories, which brings in the, um, the visual aspect of what was going on for the person at the time, the emotional aspect, the sometimes the auditory aspect, sometimes the olfactory aspect of it, and most certainly the physiological aspect of of the the memory as well. So that when we're working with uh, something that happened a long time ago for the person, we've reactivated all those aspects of their experience, and all those aspects are well and truly present in the therapy. So I'd say EMDR is well and truly able to be considered an experiential therapy. Yeah. And 
And um, could you say a little bit, James, about what do you find about this that's very powerful in your experience? What, what, what's kind of really good about this way of working, do you think? Well, look, I, I think that there's a couple of things. One, one is certainly its effectiveness. When I started using EMDR, um, the level of effectiveness kind of went through the roof from, in my work may not be the case for everybody and it's maybe a matter of finding the right therapy that really works for you and really resonates with you but for me um, the level of effectiveness just became so noticeably better that uh, rather than often being a very frustrating type of experience most of my therapy sessions became extremely rewarding in that I began to see fairly quickly you know very very large noticeable differences in in the client's experience of uh primarily the memories that we we're working with and how that then translated into their day-to-day -day experience without carrying the burdens around those those memories um so the level of effectiveness just rose exponentially and that was um a great thing to encourage me to keep on using it also during the session <clears throat> um in in it using emdr it's quite an active process so uh, we certainly need to spend time listening to the person getting a sense of what their experience has been what their experience is now what they bring with them into the therapy session what their current difficulties are how those current difficulties relate to previous experiences what that connection is so we certainly spend a great deal of time listening to all that taking that information in uh, engaging in case formulation about the relationship between their previous experiences and what's going on for them now. And of course, we all know that people primarily need to be listened to in order to develop the kind of therapeutic relationship which is necessary. However, when we get into doing the EMDR, um, it's a very active process for the practitioner. So we don't spend a great deal of energy at that time when we're doing the process simply asking the client to retell their experience over and over again and us just sort of passively listening to the retelling of their experience over and over again but it's a very hands-on active kind of process which for me makes it really quite interesting and exciting so both the effectiveness and the experience for myself providing EMDR is really very rewarding and I'd say much more rewarding than the other approaches that I've used previously. And then sort of like when you think about, you know, when it's somebody new comes to see you, a new client, you're talking about sort of listening and, you know, doing your formulation, you know, kind of talk talking about what's happened for the client, well, how it's affecting their life today. What are you kind of listening for in terms of, okay, this is somebody I'm going to, I'm going to work, I'm going to prepare to work experientially with maybe with an EMDR kind of approach? Well, you know, case formulation is very important in this context. So certainly people come to us with a, a often a, a range of current experiences uh, which are distressing for them or, you know, often called symptoms or presenting problems. And in terms of EMDR, we're wanting to get a sense of whether their presenting problems now relate to experiences that they've had in the past and whether th these past experiences have set them up and basically sensitized them to um, experiencing the problems that they are having in the present time. So what we're primarily listening for initially, at least, is um, trying to get information that will give us a sense to tie in both the past with the present. And of course, the present is where the experiential element of this is. So. We definitely, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a paradox in a sense that with EMDR we're working a lot with the past, but the past is only ever real in somebody's present experience. So um, we like to think that we're working with 
experiences from their childhood or high school years or whatever it might be, that when a, a client brings these uh, issues to us to work with, of course, they're bringing those issues in their present moment. Um, and they're, they're experiencing some aspect of those past events in the present moment. So we're definitely listening for how the past may impact on their present moment, how it um, infiltrates their current experience, how it impacts on their mood, impacts on their behaviour, impacts on their, their way of making sense of themselves and sense of the world and sense of other people. We're working with all that material. Um, as I said, it's a bit of a paradox that we spend a lot of time working with past experiences, although not exclusively. Working with the past is only one of the one of the three phases of EMDR. It's where we spend a lot of the time working with the past experiences. But once we've finished working with those, we move on to what we call the current triggers. So it's quite possible for us to help a person to become far less affected by memories of the past but for them to still be triggerable in their in their current experience and when that's the case when we finish working with the past experiences then we move on to the second phase which is working with the current triggers and this is essentially the things that are going on in their lives now which have, still have the power to generate a lot of distress for them so we spend a fair bit of time at that point working with their current experience so okay that's great james and then when, when you're talking about those phases and i'm just wondering like is there um a psychoeducational bit that's that runs through all that or do you kind of talk a bit about about what you know how the how this will work with the client up front or how would that work then yeah yeah there's at the initial stage of the intervention there's quite a bit of psychoeducation um you know we have a particular theory of change and um where our theory of change tends to coincide with the client's theory of change then we have a really good match and we can we can we're up and running um people people in our culture have now had 30 or 40 years of experience of CBT being the primary notion of what constitutes therapy in our culture. Um, many of the clients that I work with have gone through many years of trying CBT with a range of different practitioners. And it's not unusual for me to be presented with people that wind up saying, well, I've, I've done all that and it just hasn't worked for me. It hasn't made any difference. But nevertheless, people through that process have been kind of educated into the idea that what therapy is about is about talking about their thoughts and about their ways of making sense, their, their cognitive structures around their experiences. And that's not primarily what EMDR is about. So when somebody comes to me with um, a CBT type uh, theory of change, then if they're going to work with me, they need to get it. Obviously, they need to get an understanding of the, the theory of change that EMDR is using. And when that's the case, there's there's a, obviously a fair bit of psychoeducation involved in that. What I find is that most the, the, the theory of change that EMDR uses, which really connects their past experience and how that informs their current experience, seems to be one that most people in our culture intuitively understand and probably bring with them to the therapy anyway. Um, most people have an, an intuitive sense that their past is highly relevant to their current experience. Uh, we, we, we have this sense of connection quite naturally that we can see how, how we um, feel and function in our lives now is at least in some part related to our experiences from the past. So most people bring that that understanding with them into the therapy sessions with me and they don't require any convincing around uh, this connection between their past and their present. Um, however, in early early in the intervention, I do once once I've basically got the client's story, I get a sense of what's gone on for them, what's going on for them now that's brought them into therapy. Um, what their experiences are around the difficulties what the, the background may be to their difficulties, etc. then I tend to do a reasonable amount of psychoeducation in helping them to draw the links between 
their past experiences and how that impacts on their experience of their current reality. So there's certainly psychoeducation involved in that part of the process. People, you know, most people are fairly intelligent and they, I think they require an adequate explanation as to why doing something like that would make any sense at all. Um, it struck, when I first came across it, it struck me as a fairly um, ridiculous proposition that waving your hand back and forwards could have any, any possible beneficial impact. Um, and I guess I required a lot of explanation to try to make sense of how that could possibly be helpful. And I think people are owed the same kind of explanation. So rather than spend a lot of time explaining what I think EMDR is all about, people have prepared a couple of um, YouTube uh, videos that I uh, go into my explanation of what I think trauma is about, how that connects with their current experience and what EMDR does in relation to trauma. And um, after the first or second sessions with people, I'll generally uh, ask them to watch those videos. So as you know, th th that's the psychoeducation process. And the re only reason why I've got them on videos is it saves therapy time, uh, which is quite valuable. And they can just simply access that information in, you know, in their own home through the videos. I'm just wondering, James, if you could kind of maybe flesh out a bit for us how you work experientially with the client. Like, what does that look like then? Okay, well, again, because I primarily work with EMDR, this is, this is going to be um, focused on that particular approach. So when we're conducting um, a session working with a particular memory, and we're applying what's referred to as bilateral stimulation, which for the most part is the eye movements, well, my hand going backwards and forwards across their visual field. We start that session by setting up um, essentially the uh, uh, reactivating the, the, the neural pathways around that memory that we're working with. So we reactivate the memory system. And we do that through, uh, before I, before I going to talking about that essentially what we need to understand is that when we're working with a memory uh we're not it's not like we're hitting the play button on a video recorder the the popular conception of memory is something along the lines of that that we've got something like a video recorder in our head and somehow we press a play button and what happened when we were 10 years old just simply gets played play it out something like a video within our mind whereas the reality is that memory is in fact a very creative and a constructive process so if we have a, a pleasant memory of laying on a beach when we were 10 years old and it's a very fond memory when we're thinking about that our mind brain is actually going through a constructive process to recreate what that was like and there's lots of different elements of the brain areas that are involved in reconstructing that that uh, that memory. So we may feel the warmth of the sand beneath us as we're laying on the beach. Um, we may hear the sound of birds, seagulls, you know, waves gently breaking, kids laughing, splashing in the water. So the auditory areas of our brain become activated in order to recreate that sound. We may feel the warmth of the sunshine on our back. So the, the tactile responsive parts of our brain reactivate that sensation. We may smell the salty sea air, so the olfactory parts of our brain reactivate that sensation. We may be eating an ice cream in the memory laying on the beach, and so the sweetness of the ice cream will be recreated for us. And all these different elements come together to recreate the memory. So it's a constructive and a creative process. The mood that we're in when our brain is doing that reconstruction is also factored into that reconstruction, which is a very important component for uh, memory reconsolidation, which is also an, an important lens to bring to EMDR. So when we're setting up an EMDR session, we generally start with we've targeted a particular memory that we want to work with. And we'll generally start off by asking the client to get a sense of in that whole experience, what feels like the worst moment. Um, and it's not always the most obvious that we might think would be the worst moment. So 
let's say, uh, a sexual assault victim, uh, we may think, well, the assault itself may be the worst moment. However, when we're speaking to that person, they may reveal that the responses of others around them when they reveal that they've been sexually assaulted may have been the worst moment for them. So it's not always obvious. We can't just go with what seems obvious to us. So the client reveals what feels to them to be the worst moment in that memory. We'll then ask them, uh, what's the visual picture that comes into their mind's eye that, that captures that worst moment? And so the client will describe to us either something like a movie scene unfolding or a, a snapshot photo. We then ask them, when you're in touch with that picture, what's the negative thought or belief about yourself? So there's a cognitive element that, that is always factored into our experiences as well. And typically, when people have been through traumatic or adverse experiences, somehow we manage to wangle in there something negative about ourselves, either I'm not good enough, that's why this terrible thing happened to me, or it's my fault, or I can't cope with with terrible things happening or um, I have no power to defend or to protect myself, etc. And so that's going to be part of the memory, the memory uh, as well. So we, we ascertain that from people and then we get them to look at the picture, uh, tune into the emotions that come up for them when they're in touch with that picture. Often it's, you know, sadness, fear, anxiety, might be anger, et cetera, embarrassment, humiliation, et cetera. Um, bring also into the equation the negative thought or belief about themselves. And when they're holding all those, what do they know is going on in their bodies? So we get them to really tune into their bodies. And if anybody, any of your listeners are aware of polyvagal theory, you'll be aware that when we're in a highly distressed state, the we tend to feel that distress physiologically somewhere down the vagal nerve, which can include the stomach, anywhere in the stomach, the chest and the throat. And so very typically people will report they feel, you know, an odd sensation in their stomach, a disconcerting sensation or a tense, a sense of constriction or tightness in their chest or in their throat. But it's often not contained to that. So people will often report physical sensations from any part of their body. And I suspect that probably has to do with their mind, brain reconstructing the experience. And if they've got a tension in their shoulders or their fists are clenched or they've got tingling sensations in their feet or legs, then more than likely they actually had those sensations when the bad experience was happening in reality. And as part of the, the, the reconstruction that their mind brain does, it brings up those physiological experiences as well as part of the memory package. So once all of those have been brought into the person's field of awareness through responding to the questions that I've been asking them, we consider that, that the memory network has been reactivated and that needs to happen in order for any real therapeutic change to occur. So it's simply not enough to have people talking ab about their distress, talking about their experience without actually being reactivated into that place they they really need to be reactivated into that that uh memory experience through the physiological awareness of what's going on in their bodies when they're in touch with it the emotions that come up for them when they're in touch with that memory the visual aspects of what comes up for them sometimes clients say that certain sounds occur to them so people that have been in combat experiences or in car accidents will often report hearing the sounds of explosions or the sounds of cars crashing. Um, sometimes people will say that certain smells or fragrances occur to them, which are not in the current environment. So we know that memory is highly associated with, with smell, with the sense of smell. Uh, so it's not unusual for people that have been assaulted by somebody that, that had a particular aftershave or perfume or fragrance or the smell of alcohol or cigarettes or whatever to for that to become uh, to come up for them when they're undergoing EMDR as well. So all these different aspects of the experience that they had in the past get reactivated in the present. And as I said before, even though we're dealing primarily with past experiences, we're dealing with them in the present moment. And because it's a present moment, it means that the brain is actually reconstructing. It's bringing together all these different elements of the experience 
to reconstruct the memory and all that's occurring in the present moment. So when that's, once that's been reactivated for the person, we then administer what's called the bilateral stimulation, getting them to follow my hand backwards and forwards across their visual field. We do that in sets of about 30 seconds or so. The basic instruction for the person is simply to follow my hand with their eyes and just notice what comes into their awareness as their eyes are moving. Uh, they don't need to try to make anything happen or to make anything come into their awareness. They also don't need to try to stop anything from coming into their awareness. It's a reasonably passive process for them. The request is simply that they follow my hand and just notice what does come into their awareness. And what comes into their awareness will typically be in the form of, it could be more pictures. Again, it could be more movie scene unfolding or more still shot photos. It could be, thoughts or words or ideas pop into the head different perspectives it could be different emotions that rise and fall in succession uh, it can be different physical sensations that come and go for them in different parts of their body it can be different sounds and different smells or fragrances that occur to them they don't have to do anything with what's coming up for them they're just simply noticing it after 30 seconds or so we stop i get them to take a deep breath and clear their mind as they breathe out. So whatever it is that came up from during that 30 seconds, the instruction is just to let it go with the out breath and then just to simply notice what comes into the awareness at that point in time once they've breathed it all out. Whatever comes up for them, again, it could be in the form of pictures or thoughts or words or ideas, emotions, physical sensations, etc. That simply becomes the starting point for the next 30 seconds and we continue doing that. Now, typically over the course of the session, what we find is the more the longer that we're doing this um, and more different material is coming and going and coming and going for the person different emotions are rising and falling different physical sensations are coming and going typically by the end of the session the person in response to the questions that i'm asking along the way the person is typically able to answer that they can still get in touch with that memory the emdr doesn't change autobiographical memory and I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole if it did simply because I think we need to have our memories. They, they inform us about how to proceed in life. So the person will typically say, I still have the memory, but when I think about it now, I don't feel the distress I felt before. Either I feel fairly neutral about it or it just feels really quite a low level of distress, maybe the kind of distress I would feel for any 10-year-old kid that I heard about that had gone through that kind of experience. When I think about it now, my thoughts about myself are more self-enhancing rather than self-deprecating. And when I think about it now, my body feels really quite calm and relaxed. And that tends to be the acid test. So my observation is that we can, we have a capacity to, as humans, to trick ourselves really quite well on an emotional level. We can try to, and we can get away with it, often convince ourselves that we don't feel what we actually do feel emotionally. Um, we can fool ourselves cognitively. We can tell ourselves certain things that we don't really believe. We can try to make sense of our experience in ways that are not natural to us. So we can kind of trick ourselves cognitively, but our bodies never lie. So the final acid test of EMDR to, to evaluate whether it's been effective or not is basically having the person do a body scan while they're holding the memory. And this is usually towards the end of the session. If when they're holding the memory and they're doing the body scan, there are still areas of distress that are felt in the body, then we know that we haven't completed the work yet. I often think of EMDR as being a bit like removing a splinter. And sometimes splinters come out in one go, you know, really neatly and cleanly. And sometimes the splint is fragmented and we need to have multiple goes at getting the fragments of the splinter out. So when a person does the body scan towards the end of the session and they're reporting that they still feel some tension or you know pressure in their chest or constriction in their throat or a funny feeling in their stomach, then I know that we may have got some fragments of the splinter out, but there are elements that are still remaining and we need to continue doing the work. When people are able to report they're holding the memory at the end of the session, they're feeling quite okay when they're holding the memory. Like I said, they may feel some sadness for the 10 year old that they were, but they don't any longer feel that they are now the 10 year old in that situation. And the horror or the high intensity anxiety or fear is no longer present for them. Um, 
when their thoughts about themselves are more self-enhancing rather than beating themselves up. And then when we would do a body scan while they're holding the memory, if they're able to say that their body feels really quite calm and relaxed, and that's a really good indicator that uh, the memory reconsolidation process has been successful. It's been launched through processes which we may talk about. And essentially that person's relationship to that memory has radically altered. That memory is no longer carrying the emotional charge that it used to carry. Now we'll, we'll check in with them in the next session, it may be one or two weeks later, we'll ask them to go back to the memory again, just to see whether that's held or not. Most of the time it tends to have held over the, over the time frame between sessions, but if it hasn't held, what it simply means if there's still uh, remnants of that distress, it means that there's still fragments of that splinter in there. And maybe another, another element or another aspect of the experience that we're yet to work with that we still need to do. And we'll simply go through the same process again with that, with that uh, element that hasn't yet been addressed. I'm just wondering, James, you know, when you're kind of working with different clients, I imagine some of them kind of take to this more naturally in an experiential way than others. Do you find that there's some clients where, you know, it doesn't kind of the experiential side of it, this, you know, this resistance or, you know, it's resistance is maybe not the right word, but, you know, it, it maybe it needs to be adapted in certain ways or what do you find with that, with different clients? I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, well, look, you know, even though I've I've found EMT, EMDR to be the most effective therapy of I've come across and, and utilised, there are no, as we all know, there are no magic bullets in this in this field. Nothing works for everybody. And there are certainly clients that I've worked with that EMDR has proven to be ineffective for. Um, my observation is that it, it is effective for most people that I've worked with, but not with everybody. So with those that it's not effective for, then I need to develop a, a plan B, which you know may involve referral to somebody else that provides a different kind of approach. Um, one of the one of the, the standard modifications that I use with EMDR, a stand a, a modification to the what's called the standard protocol is uh, utilising uh, inner child resourcing when I'm working with the person. So most of the people that I work with um, are not coming to me with uh, an adult onset, one traumatic experience kind of scenario. Occasionally I do come across people like that. You know, they've had a car accident or they've been involved in an act of violence and that's the first horrible thing that's happened to them in their lives. But most of the clients that I work with are people that have generally got an extensive history of trauma and distress. And maybe the recent car accident or the recent act of violence is simply the last of a long succession of horrible experiences. And very typically, the horrible experiences tend to go back to their childhood. So um, we're talking about overt acts of violence to children, which are unfortunately quite common, uh, sexual assault, verbal, physical, emotional violence, etc. but also um, developmental trauma where the problem is not so much what was done to the child as much as what the child didn't experience from their caregivers. They didn't experience the love, the care, the uh, nurturance, etc., so very typically, and, 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 and quite a lot of the time, I'm working with people that have experienced both that developmental trauma as well as overt adverse life events through the form of uh, violence, etc. So very typically, um, we need to go back to working with those kind of experiences first because they have been the foundational building blocks upon which all the other subsequent experiences have been added to. And the kind of sense that children arrive at about their own worth, about the nature of other people and the nature of the world in general, whether it's safe or a dangerous place, has been created through those early experiences. And, of course, they take those, those uh, lenses with them to all their subsequent experiences, which then keep on adding to those negative schemas, if you'd like to call them those. 
So we typically need to go back and work with the uh, the earlier childhood experiences. And when we're in the middle of working with those kind of experiences using EMDR, more often than not, I'll do some inner child resourcing with them. I'll get them to close their eyes and I'll get them to see themselves as, a, as the adult that they are now, going entering the situation that we've been working with, the situation in which the child was abused or neglected or whatever it might be, with the purpose being to simply do whatever's required of the adult to help that child with the situation they find themselves in. And uh, my experience, my observation is pretty well everybody, just about everybody, has a good sense of what they needed as a child, what was not done to help them. They have a fairly good sense of what they need to do to help the child that they were. And most people are very able to use their imagination and re-enter that scene you know, extract the child from whatever the dangerous situation was and nurture them, protect them, hold them, uh, be kind to them, do whatever's required to help that child with the experiences of what they're, what they're going through. Typically that's going to create a very different sort of emotional experience for the person. So once they've managed to do that, I'll then ask them to get a sense of what it, does it feel like for the child to have the adult version of them there holding their hand or hugging them or taking them away from the dangerous situation, letting them know that they're safe, letting them know that they're a valuable person, that they're cared for, they're loved, etc. And the clients are generally able to sort of tune into what that's like for the child and report things like, well, I feel safe, I feel valued, um, I feel okay as I am, I feel like a worthwhile person, etc. I get them to step into what that feels like for the child, see if they can put themselves in that position and step into that place of feeling what it feels like to be valued or nurtured or safe or whatever it may, may be. And then once they're in touch with that and getting a sense of where they feel that in their body and generally it's going to have a very different kind of physiology associated with with the, the the nurtured experience for the child then I'll do some more sets of eye movements with them focusing on what that what that feels like for them that tends to reinforce that different physiological state and uh, as some of your uh, listeners may be aware of memory reconsolidation you'll recognize that the two necessary components for memory reconsolidation to be launched have been activated we've activated the the distress neural pathways through the initial setup of the session, getting them to reveal to me the worst part of the memory, the visual aspect that goes with that, the negative thoughts and beliefs about themselves, the emotion that goes with that, and the physiological state that goes with that distress pathway that's been fully reactivated. We've spent quite a bit of time um, revealing that, so the bilateral simulation tends to bring all that up with more intensity. That's been really quite well reactivated. And then at some point, either they spontaneously, um, what comes up for them when we're doing the bilateral stimulation is some kind of experience which stands in sharp contradiction to the what's been reactivated in the distress neural pathways, or I will engineer that through doing the inner child resourcing. And the person is able to then experience a very different kind of emotional state. As I said before about the nature of memory, when all when when the mind brain is reconstructing all these different elements of the experience, the emotional state during that reconstruction gets factored into that reconstruction. So when the person, so let's say through the inner child, focused, been able to feel safe and cared for and worthwhile, then those feelings actually get re constructed back into that memory network. And that's essentially what memory reconsolidation is all about. So the distress that's attached to that neural pathway has been um, somewhat eradicated and in its place comes in these different feelings of feeling worthwhile and safe and highly valued, etc. And that now becomes part of that memory network. And that's essentially memory reconsolidation, which EMDR is one of the, the many forms of transformative psychotherapies that, that uh, generate memory reconsolidation.
I know James, you're very interested and, and you work a lot with, with clients with with chronic pain and i and i know this i believe this is something that you've you've experienced in your own life um would that be something you would work very experience experientially with as well then yeah certainly um and you know th th there's a range of ways of working experientially with chronic pain i know, I know coherent therapy is one of those ways um i think any any form of experiential approach to chronic pain has a far better chance of helping people to resolve it than any non-experiential approach so the non-experiential approaches to working with chronic pain are primarily cbt and my observation is that sometimes that works more often than not uh, it doesn't in that the most that CBT practitioners seem to be aiming for with patients of people suffering from chronic pain is for them to learn to live with being in pain, to learn to decatastrophize being in pain and to learn to accept it. Um, I understand acceptance is far better than non-acceptance, but the reality is that, well, my observation is and my personal experience is that many people are actually able to go way beyond just simply accepting being in pain and find some kind of resolution to the pain whereby radically, radically diminishes or actually ceases to, to bother them at all through you know, ceasing to exist. Um, I haven't come across any non-experiential way that helps people to resolve chronic pain. And when I say resolve, as I said, it means either radically reducing the pain so it's no longer as problematic or actually the pain ceasing to exist at all. Um, but I have come across a, a raft of different experiential approaches that seem to have the power to do that, to bring people to a point of non-pain. Non and EMDR is the approach that I tend to use most with that. Now, uh, in approaching chronic pain, uh, I run with the, with the observation that most people that experience chronic pain, once, once clear medical um, explanations for the pain have been excluded, and primarily undetected cancers or undetected infections or you know, functioning uh, below the skin, and once those have been medically excluded, then uh, I tend to work with a psychological approach to dealing with chronic pain, and I probably the first in the first pillar of that is the observation through research that the vast majority of people that experience chronic pain, uh, people that carry significant emotional psychological trauma. I think it's around the 80 something percent. So there's a very strong association between psychological trauma and the experience of chronic pain to such an extent that I would have to say that uh, our mind brain is able to express trauma in our bodies and it, one of the great ways of doing that is through chronic pain but also other medically inexplicable conditions other health conditions that just don't seem to resolve despite all the interventions that have been thrown at it so if we start as i do with the observation that most people that are carrying chronic pain are also people that are carrying significant psychological trauma, then it becomes obvious that we need to work with the trauma. If that's what's driving the, the pain, if that's what's creating a state of affairs whereby their mind brain is generating physical pain, then we need to work with the emotional pain, which is more than likely the driver behind that. And again, I use EMDR to work with the, um, with the, uh, adverse life events which have created the burden of distress uh, from which our mind brain generates their very real physical pain. Um, sometimes when we've worked through the, the list of adverse life events, traumatic experiences for the person and they still experience some pain, then we apply EMDR purely on the, the experience of pain itself. So rather than working with a memory, we will get them to tune into their experience of pain in their, in their therapy session. So where do they feel it in their body? What is the sensation like? 
if they did, could describe it by a color, what color would it be, by shape, by size, by texture, all these kind of ways of relating to the pain where they feel it in their body. We also uh, get from them the negative views that they have themselves because of the pain. So it's quite typical that people that have protracted chronic pain also beat themselves up about the pain. They view themselves as being inadequate or as having failed in some way or as being hopeless and helpless, um, you know, believing that they are crippled people and they're less valid as human beings because they're in pain, etc. So typically there's a whole bunch of ways that we can beat ourselves up about being in chronic pain. And that's ascertained as well in the EMDR process as well as the emotions. What, is it, what does it emotionally feel like to register that physical pain right now? And people will generally feel extremely sad, frustrated. People will often feel grief, intense grief about being in pain because of all the things, all the changes that it's made in their lives and all the things they've had to let go of. A loss of sense of self from being a highly physically active, physically capable person to now feeling like a cripple. So there's often grief around a uh, loss of sense of self, uh, anger, you know, frustration, depression, all sorts of feelings that go along with being in pain. So all these are brought up in the questioning at the beginning of the EMDR session. And then we get them to focus on the, the sensation of the pain itself while we apply the bilateral stimulation. And there are times when that will, the pain will actually begin to diminish as the session goes on. And there are times when the pain won't diminish, but different aspects of the person's functioning. So the cognitive aspects, the emotional aspects and different, different areas of physiology begin to alter uh, over the course of the session. So even if the pain doesn't diminish, uh, the extremely negative and emotionally charged view of themselves may begin to lighten up. They may, may begin to view themselves with more compassion rather than just as being a, a miserable failure. And if that happens for somebody during the course of the session, that will feel like an important change for them. Um, if they can begin to feel more compassionate about themselves in general, in spite of having chronic pain, then that has, has, has it starts a process of altering their experience of themselves vis-a-vis -vis the pain. And there's a really good chance if that continues, that will actually begin to have a positive impact on the experience of pain as well. The pain will more than likely begin to diminish if they stop beating themselves up about being in pain. So there's a range of ways that EMDR can, can have a positive impact on pain. But as I said before, I'm aware that it's only one approach. I know that coherence therapy also um, uses highly experiential approaches for working with chronic pain, which I believe are really quite effective as well. So, you know, you came, you came from a very traditional cognitive behavioral training uh, 30 years ago, and you did the solution focused, brief solution focused training shortly after. And now you work in this very experiential way. And what would you kind of, what would your message be for maybe your younger self, if, if you like, uh, if you think about it that way, or, or other people who are not so familiar with this way of working and just maybe just don't know much about it? What, would, what kind of message would you have, do you think? Well, um, I'd say there, there's, there's a multitude of approaches that uh, fit under the rubric of experiential psychotherapies. And I guess it's a matter of people finding one that simply sits well with them. And there's a range of different options available. And, and they have definitely, definitely share some similarities. But there are also differences between these, these approaches. And I guess it's a matter of people finding one that fits really well for them, for who they are as a person, for how they like to relate to other people in, in a therapeutic context, etc. So there's a bunch of options that are available for people. And I, I guess that's, that's an exploratory process, which for some of us will take many years and some people might luck upon that 
very early in their careers and that may come down to being just a matter of luck but if there's one book that i would suggest people read at any point in their career whether they be starting out as a therapist as a new graduate or they're a seasoned therapist if there's one book that i would, I would recommend people get hold of read and actually study is unlocking the emotional brain by bruce ecker uh tully and uh, sorry hully and tisic and i'm not quite sure of the year that that was published but i'm pretty sure it's just a little over 10 years ago now and in that book the authors describe um, the importance of memory reconsolidation as it relates to psychotherapy now um, Bruce Ecker was he started his career as a research scientist so he's very capable of plowing through very dry scientific research articles and something which I tried to do in regards to memory reconsolidation, and I found it almost unintelligible. But because Bruce Ecker uh, is also a research scientist, he was able to go to the original sources of research around memory reconsolidation and essentially translate that into meaningful terms for psychotherapists. And that's what is in Unlocking the Emotional Brain. So it contains the most important aspects of neuroscience research as, a, as it relates to memory reconsolidation, a form of neuroplasticity. And it translates that into terms which are intelligible for psychotherapists. The beauty of, I was going to say the beauty of the book, there's quite a few beauties of the book, but one, an additional beauty of the book is that the authors present a range of different transformative psychotherapeutic approaches. And it demonstrates how each of them utilize memory reconsolidation to produce the therapeutic outcomes that they do. I think there's probably about six different approaches that are provided with case study examples and an analysis of how each of these different approaches are uh, utilizing memory reconsolidation. So anybody reading that book is going to get a very good education about <clears throat> probably the most important form of neuroplasticity as it relates to psychotherapy, but also some excellent examples of what memory reconsolidation looks like in practice and a sense of the menu available of different approaches that that utilize memory reconsolidation so if if i as a as a as a new graduate came across and read one book i wish it had been that one and it may have um got me onto stuff that was most effective pretty early in my career but it's never too late to start it doesn't matter where people are in their careers um, we're all aware of the need for ongoing education and to keep on reevaluating what it is that we're doing and trying to improve our practice. So I'd really highly recommend that as probably the one book that any therapist should read. Yeah, and I, I can heartily agree, James. I certainly, when I came across it, I, I, I had that same reaction. It was, I was very glad I kind of discovered it and it's a very great read and it does draw together a number of different therapies um, around the themes that that are what we're talking about, like that memory reconsolidation and working with memories in that way to transform, to bring about transformative change. So I, I, I heartily agree with your recommendation there today. Mm. So, um, you know, I think maybe we might leave it there. What do you think um, for today? Um, I know come up, coming up on an hour and I don't want to keep you um starting the, you're starting the day over in australia we're, we're finishing the day here in ireland um mm. so i just want to say very a very warm and and heartfelt thank you james dr james alexander for coming here today to talk to us about your work and um uh, you know hopefully we might um get you back at some stage and maybe you know go into some of, some of those topics in a little bit more detail or maybe take it in some new directions uh what do you think That'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to do it. Thanks very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed the chance to talk with you about the stuff that I'm I'm passionate about. Thank you. Yeah.